I got myself some help for this one. Welcome back factory owners. As requested by a vocal majority, this video is about slicer tuning. More specifically about how to get the highest quality possible because this is what most of you care about. Technically, these are the same things you have to consider if you want to print fast. Since there are a few other factors that will diminish your print quality even with perfect slicer settings, I'll need to briefly mention those as well. All tips are shown in Prusa and Orca Slicer, but should work just as well with Cura and Friends. The options might be named differently though. So buckle up for some serious knowledge and let's dive right in. I just recently had my Voron 0.2 degrade in printing quality from this to this. It happened suddenly in the middle of a print and persisted. Luckily, the Voron Stealth Burner is extremely maintenance friendly. A quick disassembly revealed rather slippery extruder gears. Since I'm currently building another Voron 0.2 with a few custom changes, I had a similar gear on hand to compare it to. While trying to scratch my fingernails with the teeth of the extruder gear, the lack of grip was instantly noticeable. The gears were cheap Chinese Bontage clones, so I went ahead and ordered a pair of genuine ones. A friend recently had similar problems with his extruder and I suspect slippery gears as well. A bit of wear always happens. For cheap clones made of softer metal, this happens faster. With filled filaments like carbon fiber, this can happen even quicker, since they are usually abrasive. In my case, that was only half of the equation. Extrusion was possible again, but not as fast as before. Residue in the nozzle accumulating over time from printing hot and fast made up the other half of the issue. It was probably the reason why the gear started slipping in the first place. Long story short, always make sure your extrusion system is in good shape. Don't hesitate to change the nozzle if you notice a degradation in quality. It's totally fine to use the cheap ones. I never noticed any difference in print quality. Not even with the Chinese CHT nozzle clones. You get better results for less money by changing cheap nozzles regularly rather than using an expensive nozzle for longer. A lot of you favor PETG as a go-to material. While it doesn't warp nearly as much as ABS does, it makes that up with being hygroscopic. It's already prone to stringing when dry and that tendency only increasing with moisture absorption. Wet filament also increases the likeliness of other print artifacts caused by water evaporating while melting. This also makes parts turn out weaker than those printed with dry filament. For optimal results, you should dry your filament thoroughly after unpacking. Even straight from its packaging, it can already be moist since you never know for how long the manufacturer stored the spools before wrapping. Drying in a home oven is generally not recommended since all materials can give off fumes of some kind and I wouldn't want to risk those getting into contact with the food I eat. Specialist filament dryers are readily available and rather cheap these days. They usually also contain a roller which you can use to print directly from. Just make sure to always stay below the softening temperature while drying. For my most hygroscopic materials, namely nylon and polycarbonate, I modded an IKEA 365 box to contain spool rollers and some silica pearls. Using regular PTFE tubes and pneumatic couplers, I can use it to print without ever opening it. The filament has been in there for years and is still totally fine to print today. In the last video we talked about modeling synths and many of you complained about the lack of step file availability. But did you know that step files are not only helpful if you want to make changes to a model, but can also be directly imported into the slicer? At first I was excited and thought this could be a game changer for technical parts. But after closer examination, it seems both Orca and Prusa slicer just convert the step file into vertices just like an STL file. And as of making this video, they even do a pretty poor job, both reporting open edges in the model. Despite that, the model and slicing results look good in Orca. Prusa Slicer, on the other hand, has a complete meltdown, showing covered hold and misses entire walls after slicing. That already occurred with the first model I tested and might very well just be a fluke. For now I'm going to stick with a mesh export directly in Fusion 360. The mesh looked noticeably cleaner to me than the converted step file. Just because your printer might be able to move fast doesn't mean your hot end can't keep up melting the plastic and your extruder can keep pushing without stripping the filament. Especially PETG has a low melt flow rate which basically means you can't go as fast as with other materials. The worst case is under extrusion or a skipping extruder. 
The second worst case is pieces of unmelted plastic visible in your part. Of course, this also decreases part strength. PLA does melt easily, but it also needs a lot of cooling to not turn into a blobby mess. The upside being that blobby mess is then pretty strong. ABS on the other hand flows easily and doesn't need much cooling. Which is also the reason why I really like to print with it. The slicer option, max volumetric speed, limits the printing speed to always stay below the given melting rate of your machine and material combination. The rate cap is not one fixed point. If you go faster, you will get some under extrusion, meaning the extruder starts to slip a bit and can't push the amount of material requested anymore. There are ways to test the flow rate out there, but they usually involve a precision scale. If you have one at hand, the channel CNC Kitchen has a great video on that topic. It involves letting the printer extrude small blobs of filament at different speeds and checking the weight of the resulting blobs. Taking a slowly extruded reference as 100%, you can then calculate the percentage of under extrusion at certain speeds. In case you can't do that test, you can always try to reduce the max volumetric speed and see if things get better. For those of you wanting to go fast, this is the option you have to crank up, given your printer still has headroom to move faster. If your motion system doesn't get any faster, you can also increase the extrusion width on inner perimeters and solid infill. 0.65 mm is totally fine, up to 1 mm is possible with some drawbacks in print quality, even with a 0.4 mm nozzle. Just make sure your extruder and hot end can keep up with the increasing back pressure of the smaller nozzle orifice. While too much cooling usually results in weaker parts that still look great, assuming they don't warm, not enough cooling results in soggy prints. With small layers being printed at regular speed, that means the next layer is put on the top before the layer below has cooled down sufficiently. To prevent that, you can set the minimum cooling time a single layer has to take. At that value, the part cooling fan will be running at the given maximum value and the printer will be forced to slow down. In Orca you also have to check the box slow printing down for better layer cooling. Otherwise it won't slow down. In Prusa Slicer those options also exist but are labeled a bit less intuitively. They labeled enable fan if layer print time is below and slow down if layer print time is below. The latter automatically includes the slow down for better layer cooling option of Orca. The maximum fan speed is set a few lines above those options. On the other hand, you have more granular settings for overhang cooling. You can choose a specific fan speed for 25% increments from 0 to 100% overlap. Orca only allows for one fan speed when crossing a set overhang threshold with no speed interpolation in between. Did you catch the subtle difference in wording here? Prusa Slicer is talking about overlap, which means a lower value defines more overhang and 0 means unsupported bridges. Orca calls it overhang threshold, which means a higher number refers to less overlap and a bridge is a 100% overhang. So to be clear, Prusa calls a bridge a 0 and Orca calls it a 100. It is generally advisable to have fans at full speed for bridges and print slow. For advanced technical materials, you might need to reduce bridge cooling a bit, but it totally depends on the material chosen and the part you're printing. So a bit of experimenting is still up to you. Retraction is used to prevent material from oozing out of the nozzle when the printhead needs to travel from A to B. It's the most important countermeasure against stringing and tiny blobs. How much retraction is needed depends on the material and the distance from the extruder motor to your hot end. Especially for Bowden setups, this value needs to be rather high, up to a few millimeters to work properly. Direct extruders usually get away with one millimeter or less. Retracting alone doesn't magically stop the remaining molten material from oozing out though. It just relieves the pressure. You probably know what happens next. The nozzle spins a fine string of material from one perimeter to another. To prevent that, we need to get rid of the remaining plastic droplet. The three magic words we're looking for are wipe while retracting. What this does is move the printhead a few millimeters back to where it came from to wipe off the excess material. Unfortunately, we can't tell the slicer for how far it should move. This is entirely determined by the parameters retraction length and retraction speed. The former sets how many millimeters the filament is moved back, while the latter sets the speed at which the extruder motor moves. A lower speed gives the nozzle more time for pressure relief. You can narrow down the values you need by printing some stringing towers. 
I personally would run a few tests by feeding G-code manually to the printer and see how it behaves. Let me know in the comments if you like to learn a few neat tricks involving manually fab G-code. Dialing the settings in will help you get rid of most of your stringing problems. There is also a value for minimum travel after retraction, to stop the printer from retracting in case of small distances. If you happen to have strings and screw holes for example, you might need to lower this value. In case you end up with a rather high value of retraction, it is possible that the hotend can't build up pressure fast enough after retracting and you end up with empty sections. For demonstration purposes, I set a ridiculously high retraction value of 10 mm. In case you have the same issue but can't lower the retraction value, the option de-retraction extra length exists. It orders the extruder to push more filament back into the nozzle than it initially retracted. This is meant as a last resort and the manual states it's rarely needed. This one is my absolute favorite and somewhat of an insider tip. Z-Top is, in most cases, completely useless and increases stringing. There are good reasons to use it and we'll talk about that in a second, but for now bear with me. Material is always laid down below the nozzle and plastic usually shrinks when extruded. That means in a well dialed in system there is always at least a very thin clearance below the nozzle, assuming that your printer doesn't over extrude, which definitely does lead to small bumps the nozzle gets caught on. What setup does though is pulling a fine string directly from the surface it just printed. The toolet then travels from A to B and pulls that string with it. Having Z-Top disables helps a lot in getting rid of the last bit of remaining material. It also makes printing a bit faster since the Z-axis usually moves pretty slow given your machine uses a lead screw and not a belt driven axis. For the test print I took the Prusa default profile and only disabled Z-Top, nothing else. The difference is quite significant and obvious to the eye. Of course there are reasons to leave it enabled and those need to be decided on a per print basis. Most significantly are delicate structures in danger of getting knocked over or broken off. Steep overhangs curling up is another example. And let's not forget parts warping off the print bed. The options avoid crossing perimeters and avoid crossing curled overhangs can reduce that risk a bit but are no guarantee. The safest bet is to leave Z-Top enabled and thus most default profiles do that. While stringing is annoying, getting the nozzle caught on the print at full speed is usually catastrophic. Especially if your printer can't detect collisions, you'll end up with shifted layers. If you can't disable Z-Top for the aforementioned reasons, you still can mitigate the stringing a bit by enabling sloped lifting. Which means the nozzle is moved like a ramp instead of a straight 90 degrees upwards. Orca Slicer goes even further and implements lifting in a spiral motion pattern. Those measures help to reduce stringing at least a bit if you can't avoid Z-Top altogether. In case you're interested in going even deeper into the topic of slicing or even something completely different, there's a link in the description where you can sign up for free and let me know. No strings attached. I'd like to do a survey in the future on what you're struggling with the most so I can tackle those specific topics. You'll also get some additional tips and tricks via email exclusive to those helping me deliver the best content possible. Quick bonus tip. You can remove stringing easier using a heat gun. I use an adjustable variant for soldering, but a fixed temperature model works just as well. The key is only briefly skimming the model. The strings will then turn into small blobs you can remove with a utility knife. Some people try to get rid of the so-called elephant foot, meaning a wider extrusion than model on the first layers, by adding a fillet or chamfer directly to the model. This does reduce the effect of it, but it's fixed into the model while the issue is actually totally printer specific. For that the option elephant foot compensation exists. It simply shrinks down the first layer by the set millimeter value. Since the elephant foot depends on how close the nozzle is to the print bed, this is the only reliable way to mitigate it with every model on your specific machine. The elephant foot on resin printers has a completely different cause which is not so obvious. Let me know if you're a resin type of guy lifting your models on supports because you can't get your first layer to work. Another thing some people find unpleasant, although it personally never bothered me, are seams. Extrusion does need to start somewhere and that always means there's got to be an end as well. Wherever that happens, a seam appears. Nowadays you have the option to paint on the position where those seams should be done to hide them somewhere less obvious. But of course it's not always possible to hide the seam, so Orca Slicer comes with some additional methods to get rid of it. 
The option Seam Gap tries to reduce the bump you'll usually get at its position and is set to 10% extrusion width by default. The options Wipe on Loops and Wipe before external loops also helps to reduce the bump that occurs if the extruder just stops or starts extrusion at a point without extra movements. I hope you found the video helpful and if you want to see more you can subscribe over here and watch another one over there. See you in the next one.